But I want to share this, this story with you from the song. And it goes like this. There's a guy, and he's got uh, bottles on his shoulder, and they're all filled with water. And he's walking through the desert, and he's being really careful about drinking the bottles of water and conserving the water. And eventually he gets to a point where he runs out, and he starts to panic. And up ahead, he sees a well with a pump. And he goes over to the well, and he starts pumping it. And all he hears is metal on metal. You can imagine, he starts to panic even more. And as he looks down in the well, he sees a bucket with a note attached to it. And he pulls it up, and this is what the note says. Dear traveler, do not despair. There is enough water here. Just follow the instructions. Lift the handle of the pump. Bring it down, and when you hear the sound of metal on metal discouraging you, here is what you do. Under the pump in front of you, there's a, there is, it's under the pump in front of you, there's buried under the sand a bottle of water. Do not despair. Pick up the bottle, pick up the bottle of water, pour it into the cylinder, and start priming the pump. The moisture will get the system to work. A rush of water will start gushing out of the pump. You can drink all the water you want. Fill all your bottles, but do not forget to fill up the bottle again and leave it for the next passerby. Warning. You're going to be tempted when you see this one bottle of water to drink it. But you'll be so thirsty again, and so will everyone else who goes by. Empty it out as instructed, and you will have all the water you want, and so will everybody else going by. When you hear this story, I think one of the first things that jumps out at you is this idea of trust. Am I willing to read these words and trust what it says and to empty out this bottle of water even though right now I am dying of thirst and to empty it out with the possibility of having nothing happen, right? Especially when you're in a situation where you are desperate and this goes against what I see and what I feel in my life. And when I look at that and I think about that, it often makes me think about the Christian life. Do I really believe the words that Jesus says? Especially in moments in my life. I read the word. Am I willing to be obedient and to take Jesus at his word for salvation to where he says that I can find life in him and obedience, giving, forgiveness of others? Am I going to follow and trust what he says? For me, in my walk, one of the biggest struggles I had was trusting God and being obedient to what He was calling me to do. I knew it. I read it. I just didn't think it applied to my everyday life. And that's one of the things that we're going to look at today is trusting and obeying God in all circumstances in our lives. I call this sermon, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. When bad things happen to good people. And what I want you to walk away and to see today is that our trust doesn't depend on what we do. Our trust in God depends on who He is and who He reveals Himself to be. So we're going to look at that today. So let's start off in some prayer this morning. Father, Lord, we thank You for this opportunity to come before You, God, to dig into Your Word. Lord, we know that everything that You say has relevance to our life, has relevance to our everyday life, God. And now you're saying something again in your word today, God. Reveal this to us, and don't just show us the word, but help us to be doers of the word, God. Help us to find life that only comes from you in trust and obedience in your word and what you say, Father. And we just ask this and pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We, uh, we started off this sermon series last week by looking at 1 Kings 17. So today we're going to be looking at 1 Kings 17, verses 8 to 24. And we'll walk through the scripture. It'll be actually be up on the screen for you guys to see if you also have your Bibles with you. Uh, you remember it was last week, Ezra kicked off the sermon series and sort of gave us a background and a context for where we are right now. And you see Elijah is one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. And the situation last week was that... Uh, he is now going to be sent out by God. He's now going to be fed by the ravens, and he trusts what God does, and he goes next to a brook, and the brook is providing him water, and all of a sudden, the brook, the brook dries up. At the very end of Ezra's sermon, we hear that the brook dries up. 
And, uh, and at that point, there is a certain amount of trust that Elijah has because what Elijah had said earlier is that there would be no rain in the land until he gave the word. He very easily could have just given the word and said, okay, the brook dries up. I need some water. I'm going to give the word. But he never does it because he trusts God in what he's doing. And what God is also showing is, why is it significant about this idea of having no rain at all? Well, that goes back to the Old Testament and what God had said through their disobedience. But it was also showing in those words right there that they believed in a God called Baal, which was a storm God. And what God was also showing was God is bigger than the idols that we have in our lives. That he was stopping something that they were trusting in, which was this God that didn't even exist named Baal. So there would be no rain in the land. And what he was showing Isaiah was, you're going to learn to trust in me above anything else. So we pick up the story today. What happens after that? And this is in verse 8. It says this. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of food in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and her... She and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord he spoke by Elijah. So here is Elijah again, and he's in another situation where he is called to obedience to God. And what God says to him, I want you to go to a Gentile area, and I want you to look for a widow. Now when you hear the word widow, that equals poor. I want you to go to this woman who's a widow who is poor and that's where you're going to go and get your food. And what does he do? He obeys. And he goes and what happens? He goes there and he sees the widow right there. Now I often ask the question when I read this scripture right here is what was Elijah thinking at this time? Because when you see what's in front of you, you're like, how is God going to make something out of this right here? He's calling me to go into an area that's hostile to the Jewish people, and he's also calling me to go and ask a widow who has nothing to feed me. But what does he do? He trusts and obeys what God is calling him to do. It's interesting. When you look in the Gospels and you look in Luke 4, Jesus actually references the story right here because what Jesus is trying to show is that what he says is God could have chosen any widow, even in the land of Israel, but he chose a Gentile, which means basically God can choose a people to himself. God can choose and work through anybody whom he chooses to do it through. This is the story right here that Jesus is referring to in Luke. And he goes, and he goes, and he says, bring me some water. And as she's walking, oh, also, bring me the food that's in your hand. And what does she do to him? She says, I'm just trying to gather some sticks right now because I only got a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour and I'm about to die. And he says, I understand that. Go and do what you have said, but feed me first and then feed you and your family. And what does she do? She does it. She's obedient and she trusts in the words that he says and she goes and she makes the cake he eats, and her household eats too. She's blessed through her obedience. He's blessed through his obedience. And he says some things. He says, do not fear. And he says, thus says the Lord. And you know what? She ate for many days. When you go and you read the rest of the story, she ate for three years. She was provided because there was no rain for three years. Blessing. 
the blessing that comes with being obedient to God and what he calls us to do. Elijah is obedient because he goes to an area where he's not familiar with. He goes to a woman who has nothing, and she's obedient because he's basically telling her, feed me first and then feed yourself with nothing. And it's this idea that regardless of what happens, here is life right here that God envelops all of our life, that he is in control of every single aspect of our life. And Elijah understands that. And Elijah's being obedient to what he says right there. God is bigger than any idol we have created in our life. Why? Because he's doing all of this in Baal territory where they're worshiping another God. And God is doing it specifically for them to see that right here. And it's his trust and obedience to God that brings blessing to unbelievers in an unbelieving area. I had shared this story with you guys before, and some of you may have heard it. Many of you have not heard it. So I come from the corporate world. And um, so before I came into ministry, I used to be a corporate trainer for sales. And um, so much of my working life was me trying to do things in my own strength. And I had finally reached a point in my life, in my, my job, where I allowed God into my job. I'd never done that before. I'd always struggled to, to try to do things on my own strength. I had finally got to a place where I was being obedient to God and I was asking God before I worked on a project, Lord, what would you have me do? I need your help. And I saw the blessing that came from that. Well, one afternoon, I get an email from a friend of mine, and he works for a company. He says, we have an opening at our job for a trainer. And I thought of you, and I said, you know, I appreciate it. I said, I'm not looking to change right now. Um, and he was like, just at least have a conversation with the hiring manager and, and just see. And I was like, all right. I had a conversation that went really, really well. And so I ended up having like two or three more interviews after that. And I was thinking in my head, I was like, is this really happening? Because I really wanted to be in ministry. I just didn't know when that was going to happen. And I was like, God is blessing me. I'm, God, I'm just trying to be obedient to what you're calling me to do right now and what you want me to do. And I've seen the blessing. And if it means that I'm staying in the corporate world even longer, then I'm willing to do that. I saw the blessing that was coming from that. And I was like, Lord, thank you so much for that. Have you guys ever experienced that in your life? When you are being obedient to God's word and to what God says, man, you see the blessing that comes with it. It's one of the best feelings you can have as a Christian. I remember literally thinking as a Christian when I first became a Christian of thinking, I love being a Christian because there's nothing bad that's happened in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that, right? But what happens in your obedience to what God is calling you to do and things don't go well? Let's pick it up in verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Elijah comes to this woman and what a blessing his presence is for her life because now she's going to eat for three years and then all of a sudden her son dies. And who does she blame when it happens? She indirectly blames Elijah. Have you come to bring calamity? Have you come to bring remembrance of my sin? 
So she blames a lie, but she also blames herself. She says, of my sin. That is a very old way of thinking where something goes wrong in my life. What they would naturally do is they would say, what have I done? Where is my sin? How is my sin caused us right here? Well, it's very different from how we think today, right? Because when something bad happens in our life today, who do we normally blame? Yes. Why? Because we are good people. God, I have been obeying you. I've trusted you. And how could you let this happen to me in my life? I am a good person. You are not holding up your end of the bargain, God. That's how we think. But that's not how this woman thinks right here. She has lost her only hope. Remember, she's a widow. She's got no protection and no provision because the person who was going to be that for her has now died. And here she is holding her son in her hands. And what does Elijah do? Elijah says, give me the child. Give me the child. You know, I think about Elijah right now. What's going on in his head? Now, we don't know what's going on in his head because it doesn't say. But you think that he may have been sort of nervous about what was happening that was going to ruin his witness to this woman? You know, I've had the experience before where I've been sharing Christ with someone, I've been discipling someone, and I've been showing them Jesus and walking them along and only to have their friend come and say to them, you can't believe everything the Bible says. And in my head I was like, no, <laughs> she's going to undo everything I just did. But it's not me. It's what God is doing. But oftentimes we can be fearful that it's going to break our witness when something bad happens. But that can also be the very thing that God uses to draw that person to himself. This is where we lose faith. And it's oftentimes the reason why we don't pray. We don't pray, right? Because we don't want to be disappointed by God. I've prayed before God and you don't answer it, so I just don't pray at all. Or we don't pray because I don't want to pray in front of somebody who's a non-believer because if you don't come through God, it's going to make you look bad. So I'm actually doing this to protect your reputation. So I don't pray at all. This is what Paul Miller says in his book, Praying Life. Right? But what does Elijah do? He takes a child, he goes upstairs, and the first thing he does, he doesn't try to heal the child. Who does he cry out to? Yes. That's real faith right there. And it's, it's real faith, and it was something that God used because God actually includes it in Scripture. He was like, God, why have you brought calamity upon this? And this woman whom I sojourn, you've brought calamity in her life. But he does a positive thing, which he goes to God in prayer for help. And he shares his true feelings with God in the midst of the situation. That's real faith right there. That's what we were looking at in all the psalm series. These are people who in the midst of their sin and suffering are crying out to God as their refuge in their life. And that's exactly what he does. And he prays over this child and the child is raised and he goes down and he gives it to the woman. Now there's a certain degree of trust that she has, right? Because all of you who have children, right? And if you're a woman or a man, and you have your child who is now in your arms, lifeless, are you going to give it up to a stranger? But that's what she does. And he's raised. And he gives a child back to the mother. And you see what she says? She literally says, she said, now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth obedience. Elijah's being obedient. She's displaying a certain level of trust and obedience too. And she sees what happens when he does that. There is often times in our life that even if you are in the center of God's will and you are being obedient, things will go wrong. But God can use that. Why? Because God is in control of every aspect of our lives. You know, going back to my company, man, I was feeling good. I was like, this is about to happen. I'm about to leave. And so there was a coworker of mine who was getting ready to leave to go uh, to another job. So I shared, and I said what the opportunity was going to happen, and I was excited. And so a couple of weeks later, after she leaves, she sends me an email via LinkedIn. It was like, well, what happened? How did everything go? And I, so I hit reply, and I said, everything is going well. I said, I've had several interviews. 
I said, it looks really promising. I said, uh, if I'm going to leave, it's going to be toward like the end of September because my wife and I at the time were also trying to close on a house. And you know when you're applying for a mortgage loan, like you don't change jobs, you don't say jobs, you don't do anything. They're like, just sit down and be quiet and don't move, right? And so I was like, it's going to be the end of September. And I hit send. And something made me say, let me just see like what email address that went to. Because you know, when you're on LinkedIn, you have to set up an email address as to where you want to get your communication. And I looked, and it was the email address that she had on my previous employer. Now, what my employer does is when you leave the company, they don't shut it off. They just forward it to somebody else who's picking up your responsibilities, who happened to be the CEO's son. So I've just sent an email to the CEO's son saying, I'm getting ready to leave. I've had several interviews. It's looking good. It's going to be the end of September. <laughs> and you can imagine, like, the, the, it, in my gut, I was, like, sick. I was like, there is a very good chance I'm going to lose my job. And if I lose my job, we're not going to be able to move into this house. So you can imagine my wife's pleasure. <laughs> and my wife said what any good wife would say is, you just can't keep your mouth shut, can you? <laughs> and literally, it was a Sunday. And you know, you're like in panic. I can't do anything. Nothing's open. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do. And I remember I prayed and I said, Father, I said, I messed up. I said, I admit that I truly messed up. I said, Father, I ask for your forgiveness, but I also, Lord, realize that you are in control. If this means I get laid off, if this means I lose my job, I'm okay with that, God. It's not what I want, but I'm okay with that. But in the midst of this situation right here, God, you work it out, Father, to do your will, but I will not lie. Because if I lie, I'm trying to wrestle control back again and try to manipulate the situation. I'm willing to do whatever it is that you're calling me to do, Father, and you're calling me to be obedient. I'm not going to lie. I went into work on Monday, nothing. I went into work on Tuesday, and about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, my manager comes in the office, the vice president of sales, and he sits down. And he's like, how's everything going? I'm like, good. And he's like, how's the job going? I was like, good. And at that point, I was like, I'm not going to keep playing this. I knew he knew. And I was like, if this is about the email, I sent it. I said, I did. I said, I received an email from a friend of mine. And I said, and at first, I didn't want to look into this. And I said, but I felt like I at least owed it to myself to inquire about it. I said, this is what happened. And so by the end of the conversation, he says to me, so we want to know, like, what do we need to do to get you to stay here? And I was like, wow. You know, at that point, I'm like, I'll go ahead and clean out my stuff right here. <laughs> and uh, he was like, what, do you, what can we do to get you to stay? I've seen God work in so many ways in my life. I've seen him work through death. I've seen him work through job loss. I've seen him work in so many ways in my life. And what I understand is that God is in control of everything. What I am called to do is to be obedient because the blessing is in obedience and trust in God for who he is. Oftentimes when things go wrong in our life, who do we often blame? We blame God. And we say, God, why did you allow these things to go wrong? Oh, I know what it is. I'm just not praying enough. Or I know what it is. I'm not reading my Bible enough. Or I didn't say enough Hail Marys today. But let me tell you something about how God works. What God does and how God works is not dependent on what you do. It depends on who he is. That's the gospel message. When you look at the life of Jesus, you see somebody who was doing God's will perfectly. That's why Jesus says in the book of John, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He followed his father's will perfectly. And you saw the blessings that came from that. He found his disciples. He healed people. People came to know Christ for salvation through his obedience. But you also saw Jesus in his obedience. A lot of bad things happened to him. He was beaten. He was mocked. And he was hung on a cross. And he died. Jesus Christ had numerous opportunities in his life to be disobedient. 
one of the first times in his life was when Satan comes to him and tempts him three times. Satan literally comes to him and said, after 40 days of fasting, he says, he knows he's hungry. And he says, you see that rock right there? If you're the son of God, make it bread. You're hungry, eat. And he says, no, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He says, no, that's not what my father told me to do. So then he takes him to another temptation and says, okay, well, you're the son of God, right? And you're going to follow what your father says? Jump off this building because in the word it says that he'll save you. And he says, no, I don't put my father to the test because that's not what my father told me to do. And then he goes and he takes him again on top of a mountain and says, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Just bow down to me. And he says, away from me, Satan. Because what Satan's trying to do is to get Jesus away from the ultimate act of obedience, which was going to the cross. He's trying to stop Jesus from going to the cross. And Jesus says, no. Satan is telling him is, when you follow your father, you're going to die and you're going to suffer. Do it my way. Do it for yourself. You don't need God. And he's like, I do. And he's the only one I follow. That's why, he, that's why Jesus yells at Peter. When, Peter. when he tells Peter what's about to happen, he says, no, I won't let it happen. He says, get behind me, Satan, because you're doing the same thing Satan tried to do. Jesus is obedient. That's why when they're walking down the street and his disciples say to him, Rabbi, this man right here, who sinned, his parents or himself, to cause him to be blind? Jesus says, neither. It's so that the works of God may be displayed in him. Even though you see something negative right here, watch what God does through this right here. It's Jesus on the cross as people are mocking him and they're saying, ha, he saved others. He can't even save himself. Come down from the cross and then we'll believe in you. Jesus could have sent legions of angels to save him. And you know what? He never did. And even when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even in the time of Jesus' life, when it looks like his father has left him, he was right in the center of his father's will. Even to the point when Jesus says, it is finished. He knows it's done because he knows he has completed what his father has called him to do and he has been obedient to that. Why? Because Jesus knew his father and he knew his father was in control of everything. Jesus Christ knew his father's love and obeyed. He came to give his life. He came to give his life not to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. And you know what? I put my trust and faith in the guy who said he was going to die and rose again from the dead. That's where I put my faith and my trust. The gospel is not about God responding to what you do. It's about you responding to what he's done. That's the gospel message. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say in the book of Romans, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. God is in control of everything. Even if it looks negative in your life, there is a blessing that comes from being obedient and trusting God in the midst of it because that's where you find joy in your life. Elijah raised a boy from the dead and Jesus did one better. He raised himself from the dead. That's who we place our trust and our faith. And when you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he now fills you with the Holy Spirit so now you can be obedient in all circumstances of life too. So what does that mean for us? Number one, God is in control of everything. He sent Elijah into an area that they were worshiping Baal. And what does he do? He stops the rain. And he literally tells him, I have commanded her. I'm working in places and in ways that you don't even know about. God is in control of anything. He can work anywhere, in anyone, and he can do anything. God is in control. That's the very first thing. The second thing is you begin to see the Father's heart for obedience. God loves other people. Everything he does is his outward expression of his love. Jesus knew this. That's why he could be obedient to his father. He knew his father's love. He knew his father was in control. And what he asks of us, he says, if you love me, then you'll be obedient. 
Number one, God is in control. Number two, you see the Father's heart for obedience. And number three, we are called to be obedient. Obedience equals blessing. But it's not always in the way that you think or how you see it. 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah said, God said through him, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God can work through any situation. What you're called to do is to be obedient. The widow was an unbeliever. Yet she was trusted in the words that came from Elijah's mouth. And what she did was she trusted and when she saw a death and a resurrection. And for you to have salvation, you too, you trust in a death and a resurrection, which is Christ. And we trust in what he said he was going to do because he came and did it. That is the free gift that he gives us. For those of you who are believers, who you have placed and professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're like Elijah. Are you being obedient to the word? Are you even reading the Bible? Are you reading and interpreting what it says and living in your life and being obedient? Are you being obedient to what the Spirit is calling you to do? Because when you do that, you will witness to others. People are watching you to see what you do and how you live your life because God is working on other people. We're joining Him in what He's doing. And like Jesus said in Luke 4, when He recalls this story right here, God is choosing a people to himself and we join what he does I want to end with this uh, my wife can bake very well and oftentimes she makes delicious uh, meals and delicious sweets also and um, but oftentimes when she's putting something together she's using several different ingredients and when you taste those ingredients separately oftentimes like vanilla it's very bitter but when she's done mixing it all together what a sweet creation it becomes and that's exactly what God is doing in our lives oftentimes when you take these individual situations they can be very bitter but when God takes all these things and mixes them all together and you step back you see what a wonderful sweet creation that God is doing and working in our lives too to go back to the desert peat song Jesus is the one who offers a living water and if you empty your life for yourself then you too will be thirsty again and so will everybody else who comes in your path but if you empty it out for Jesus then you'll be filled again and so will everyone else who comes in your path too and how do we do it we're obedient we trust our Savior Jesus Christ, the one who was obedient to us unto his own death. Pray with me.